In section 3.2, we look at polynomial functions and their graphs. So first, a definition of a polynomial function of degree n. So a polynomial function is a function that has this format. Now, these values of a are the coefficients of x, and then we have x raised to various integer powers. So a n x to the n means that you have some number a n multiplied by x to the power n. And then we have a n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1. This is just the next lowest power of x. And when a polynomial is written in this way, we say that it's written in descending order because the powers of x go down as you move from left to right. So all of that is summarized here. So the numbers a sub n are called coefficients. The number a sub 0, which is also called a naught, is the constant coefficient or the constant term of the polynomial. And the number a n, the very first one, is the coefficient of the highest power, which is also called the leading coefficient. And a n x to the n is the leading term. So as an example, suppose we have the polynomial 3x to the 5th power plus 6x to the 4th power minus 2x to the 3rd power plus x squared plus 7x minus 6. So the leading coefficient is the number 3. The leading term is 3x to the 5th power. The degree of the polynomial is the highest degree that you have, which would always be the first term if it's written in descending order. So in this case, it's a fifth degree polynomial. The constant term is negative six. And if you were to list all of the coefficients in order, they would be these numbers here. In terms of understanding the graphs of polynomial functions, first I wanna remind everyone what the graphs of our basic power functions are. So here we have y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x to the third power, y equals x to the fourth power, and y equals x to the fifth power. And as I've pointed out in previous sections, I want you to notice that the even degree power functions are similar. They are both sort of these U-shaped graphs, and the odd degree power functions are also somewhat similar. In fact, the way that they're similar is that they go up on one side and they go down on the other side. And you can see that in each of these odd degree polynomial functions. Whereas in the even degree, they are going up on both sides. We'll come back to talk more about those power functions in just a minute. Now, in terms of graphs of polynomial functions, polynomials are nice, smooth, continuous curves. So these two graphs right here are not what polynomial functions look like. These graphs here are what polynomial functions look like. So what you should notice is that they are nice and smooth and continuous curves. So you can draw them without lifting your pencil off the paper there are no sharp points. There are no breaks in the graph. There are no corners. Okay, everything is nice and smooth and continuous. The domain of a polynomial function is the set of all real numbers. So when we graph a polynomial function, we're only going to see a small portion of the graph. However, for values of x outside the portion that we're drawing, we can describe the behavior of the graph. This is referred to as the end behavior of a polynomial. And this describes what happens to x as x becomes large in the positive direction or large in the negative direction. And to describe this end behavior, we're going to use the following notation. So the notation here is we have an x and an arrow with infinity. And this means as x goes to infinity, and that means that x is increasing without bound. 
So x is getting larger and larger and larger. Similarly, if we say x goes to negative infinity, x decreases without bound. And instead of thinking of it as being something that decreases without bound, I like to talk about this as x is becoming a very large negative number. So what does this all mean? Well, if you look at the graph here, you can see that as x gets larger, the graph is going up unbounded. So that is to say, as x is going to infinity, f of x is also going to infinity. However, on the left-hand side of the graph, as x goes to negative infinity, you can see that the function, the graph of the function, is also going to negative infinity. So we would write the following. We would say that the function f of x is approaching positive infinity as x approaches positive infinity, and f of x goes to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. That's for this graph here. Now, if you contrast that with the graph here, you'll see that something different happens. As x goes to positive infinity, the graph is going to positive infinity. But as x goes to negative infinity, the graph is also going to positive infinity. That is to say, the graph is going up on both sides. Now let's describe the end behavior of polynomials a little more precisely. We can break this down into two cases. Those two cases have to do with whether the polynomial has an odd degree or whether it has an even degree. In the case of P having an odd degree, you can see that basically what happens is as X goes to positive infinity versus as X goes to negative infinity, the function travels in opposite directions. So in the case here, as x goes to positive infinity, y also goes to positive infinity, and as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity. And this happens when the leading coefficient of your polynomial, which is this number right here, is a positive number. If you have an odd degree polynomial with a negative leading coefficient, What's going to happen is y will go to negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity, and y will go to positive infinity as x goes to negative infinity. In the case where the polynomial has an even degree, it's a little bit easier to describe. If the leading coefficient is positive, the graph is going to go up on both sides, which is to say as x goes to positive infinity, y also goes to positive infinity, and as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. And in the case where the leading coefficient is negative, it simply goes down on both sides. Now, why is this? Let's take a look at this a little more precisely. Let's consider the very simple case where f of x is x to the third power, and g of x is negative x to the third power. So here we have a very simple third-degree polynomial function. The first has a positive leading coefficient, and the second has a negative leading coefficient. Now, if we sketch the graph of f of x and g of x, we get the following. And this is easily verified by simply making a basic table of values for each of these functions. But in the first graph, you'll notice with our third degree power function, as you plug in larger values of x, you get larger values of y. And as you plug in large negative values of x, you are going to get large negative values of y. And this is why the function goes up on one end and down on the other. Now, if you put a negative in front of that, what that does effectually is when you plug in a large value of x, the value of y now becomes a large negative value because of that negative in front. And when you plug in a large negative value of x, the negative in front will turn that into a positive value of y. And so in effect, it goes up on the left side and down on the right side. 
So this is just a simple illustration of how that leading coefficient affects the end behavior of the graph. The same can be said for even degree polynomial functions. So in the case where we are graphing y equals x squared, we understand this to be a parabola, and you can see that it goes up on both sides. As x goes to positive infinity, so that is when you plug in large values of x, you get large values of y. And also when you plug in large negative values of x, you will get large positive values of y because when you square a negative, you get a positive. So this is the case where it goes up on both sides. However, if you put a negative in front of the x squared, we know that this gives us a reflection over the x-axis. In other words, no matter if you plug in positive values of x or negative values of x, the values of y are always going to be negative because of this negative in front. And what that does to the graph is it makes it go down on both sides. And so in the case where you have an even degree polynomial function, it's pretty easy to see that it's going to either go up on both sides or down on both sides. Now we spend the rest of this section discussing how to graph polynomial functions. And one thing that's important when you're drawing a graph is to be sure to discuss the real zeros of the polynomials. So if P is a polynomial and C is a real number, the following are equivalent. Number one, C is a zero of the polynomial. Number two, X equals C is a solution of the equation P of X equals zero. Number three, X minus C is a factor of the polynomial. And number four, and most important for graphing, C is an x-intercept of the graph of P. So to illustrate this, we're going to consider the simple second-degree polynomial function f of x equals 5x squared plus 5x minus 30. If I want to graph this polynomial function, now this is a quadratic function, and we just talked about how to graph those. But if I want to graph this from a more general perspective, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the zeros of this function. And that means the same thing as finding the x-intercepts of the function. And the way you do this, of course, is you factor f of x. So we can pull out a common factor of 5, since 5 divides into all those numbers evenly. And if we pull out that factor of 5, we end up with x squared plus x minus 6. And that is a relatively simple quadratic that, that we can factor relatively easily. And when we factor that, we see that f of x is 5 times x plus 3 times x minus 2. So I want you to notice that you have the factor x plus 3 and the factor x minus 2. So I'm referring to the fact that you have something like x minus c is a factor of p of x. Now, don't get confused with the x minus c. You should understand that what this really means is that something like x plus 3 can be rewritten as x minus negative 3. And, of course, x minus 2 does not need to be rewritten. And so the value of c that I'm referring to when I say x minus c is a factor is the value negative 3 and the value positive 2. And when you have those factors, we know that c is a 0 of p. In other words, if you were to set this equal to 0, the solutions would be negative 3 and positive 2. Now those are the zeros of the polynomial function. Those are also the solutions to the equation p of x equals 0. We can see that x minus c is a factor of the polynomial. And what it means ultimately is if you were to graph this, these values of x here would be your x-intercepts. So let's go ahead and sketch a graph. Now I took the liberty to graph this using a graphing calculator, but you can easily sketch a graph of this curve by finding some points. What I want to point out specifically is a couple of things. Number one, I want you to notice that the graph crosses the x-axis at negative 3 
and also at positive 2. And those are your x-intercepts that we found here. Also, I'd like to point out that the leading coefficient of the polynomial is positive 5. And it's a second-degree polynomial function. And that is why it, the graph goes up on both ends. Now, of course, there's other information that we could discuss here, like the vertex of the parabola. But we just covered that in the previous section, and that's not really the focus of what we're talking about right now. We want to talk about how to graph polynomials in a general sense. And mostly what we want to talk about in that regard is just finding x-intercepts and looking at the end behavior of the graph. Here is another example of a polynomial. Now, this f of x is given to us in factored form. So it is x plus 2 times x minus 1 times x minus 3. And if you multiply out these parentheses here, you will get the polynomial x to the third power minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. So we can see that it is an odd degree polynomial function. It has a positive leading coefficient of positive 1. And more importantly, we can see that the x-intercepts of this polynomial would be x equals negative 2, positive 1, and positive 3. And of course, you would get those by setting each of these equal to 0. Now, what does the graph look like? Let's look a little bit more into how to graph this thing. I'm going to draw a number line. And on this number line, I'm going to put all of the zeros of the polynomial in order. And when I do that, that's going to divide up the number line into four intervals. Now what I want to do is I just want to test each interval to see if the function is positive or negative on that particular interval. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. So to the left of negative 2, I'm going to pick a test point of negative 4. In between negative 2 and positive 1, I'll pick x equals 0. In between 1 and 3, I'll pick x equals 2. And to the right of 3, I'll pick x equals 6. I'm going to plug in each one of these numbers into our polynomial function, and I just want to observe whether the polynomial is positive or negative for that particular value of x. So I've taken the liberty to plug in each of those test points into our function, and the important thing to note when you plug in a value, say for example when we plug in negative 4, is that when you replace x with negative 4, you end up with negative 2 times negative 5 times negative 7. And I don't particularly care what the actual value of this is. What I care about is the fact that a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative. That is to say, it is less than 0. And then we do that for all of these test points. And so you'll see that the function is less than 0 here, so we'll put a negative sign. It is greater than 0 here, so we will put a positive sign. Less than 0 here, and greater than 0 here. Now the significance of this in terms of graphing is anytime your function f of x is less than 0, that means its graph is below the x-axis. Right? Because f of x is just the y value. And if the y value is negative, the graph is below the x-axis. And if f of x is greater than 0, the graph is above the x-axis. And so what that means is that we can get a basic sketch of the graph by simply knowing these basic concepts. Let's take a look at that graph. Here is a graph from a graphing calculator. So first of all, let's notice that we do have x-intercepts at x equals negative 2, positive 1, and positive 3, as we indicated here. And then I want you to notice that to the left of negative 2, that is to say on this interval, the function is below the x-axis when you graph it. And that's because when we plugged in our test point, we got a negative value there. However, in between negative 2 and positive 1, 
the function was positive. And you can see on the graph here, between negative 2 and positive 1, the graph is above the x-axis. Between 1 and 3, it goes below the x-axis, as indicated here. And to the right of positive 3, it's above the x-axis. I also want to point out that it has the expected end behavior. This one goes up on the right side and down on the left side. And that is because we have an odd degree polynomial function with a positive leading coefficient. Now, I graph this on a graphing calculator to show you a nice, neat graph. But you could have very easily sketched this graph without a graphing calculator by simply knowing where it crosses the x-axis, knowing that it goes up on one end and down on the other, and also knowing where it is above the x-axis and below the x-axis, along with the fact that you have a nice, smooth, continuous curve. Now, we're not getting into all the precise details of the graph, like where is the local maximum and where is the local minimum, Obviously, on the graphing calculator, you can kind of see these values a little more clearly than if you're graphing by hand, but calculus is where we learn how to do those more precisely. A few more concepts to discuss. We want to talk about what is the shape of the graph near a zero of the function of multiplicity m. So when you're graphing a particular polynomial function, and c is an x-intercept of the polynomial, or c is a zero of the polynomial, if the multiplicity of c is odd, the graph will go through the x-axis at that zero. So it'll either go through in this manner, or it will go through in this manner. But if the multiplicity of c is even, the graph won't go through the x-axis at c. Rather, it will come down and barely touch the x-axis at c. And it could do it in this manner, or it can do it in this manner. Now, what does it mean to have a certain multiplicity? Let me give you a very simple example. Suppose we have a polynomial function in factored form, and f of x is x minus 2 to the third power and x plus 4 to the second power. So we can see that x minus 2 is a factor, but it's raised to the third power. So what that really means is the following. If you were to multiply out all of the factors, you would have x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 2, x plus 4 times x plus 4. So we say that the multiplicity of x minus 2 is 3, and the multiplicity of x plus 4 is 2. So here, multiplicity is equal to 3. Here, the multiplicity is equal to 2. It's easy to identify by simply looking at the power of the factor. Now, what that means graphically is that both positive 2 and negative 4 are x-intercepts of the graph, but they will behave differently at those x-intercepts. So if I were to sketch a graph of this function, a very primitive graph of this function. Here is x equals negative 4. Here is x equals positive 2. We know the graph is going to go and touch the x-axis at both of those points. But at negative 4, since the multiplicity here is even, it is just going to touch the x-axis there. It is not going to go through the x-axis there. However, at x equals positive 2, the multiplicity is 3, which is odd. And so at positive 2, it's actually going to go through the x-axis. So what does, what does this graph look like? Well, we can see that if you multiply out all of the x's here, you are going to get x to the fifth power. So the degree of this polynomial is equal to 5. So it has an odd degree. It also has a positive leading coefficient because this is positive 1 here and positive 1 here. And if you were to multiply all of those out, you would have positive 1x to the fifth power. So we have an odd degree polynomial. We have a leading coefficient, which is equal to 1, which is positive. 
that means that the graph is going to go up on the right side and down on the left side. Now the fact that negative 4 has even multiplicity and the fact that it has to go down on the left side means that when you graph this, the graph is going to come up and barely touch here and then it's going to turn around and it's going to go through here. So the graph of this polynomial function on a very basic level must look something like this. That satisfies the end behavior of the graph and it also satisfies the fact that we have even multiplicity at this point and odd multiplicity at this point. The next concept to discuss is the intermediate value theorem for polynomials. Suppose that P is a polynomial function and A and B are two numbers and P of A and P of B have opposite signs. That is to say, one of these values is positive and one of these values is negative. If that is true, then there exists at least one value of C between A and B for which P of C is equal to zero. What that basically says is that if the polynomial is positive on one side and negative on the other side, there must be some point where the polynomial crosses the x-axis in between those two points. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. The other thing to discuss is the local extrema of polynomials. So if you have an n-degree polynomial function, the graph of that polynomial has n minus 1 local extrema at the most. So for example, if you have a fifth-degree polynomial function, you can have at most... 5 minus 1, which is equal to 4 local extrema. And we can actually see that illustration here in the one that we just graphed. This was a fifth degree polynomial function. So this tells us that we can have, at the most, 4 local extrema. Well, in actuality, we have a local maximum value here and a local minimum value here. So you can see that we actually only have two local extrema in this particular example. But we would only be able to have, at the most, four local extrema, no matter what happens if the degree of the polynomial is five. And again, we'll talk more about this in the upcoming examples as well. So now we are going to put all of this information together, and we're going to focus on graphing polynomial functions. So when graphing polynomial functions, the first thing you want to do is find the zeros of the polynomial. And you're going to do this mostly by factoring the polynomial. The reason we need these is that these are the x-intercepts of the graph. And when you're graphing your polynomial, even though you may not have precision for the whole graph, you definitely want to have precision at the x-intercepts. Next, you want to find test points. So we're going to make a table of values for the polynomial. We're going to pick test points to determine whether the graph of the polynomial is above or below the x-axis on the intervals determined by the x-intercepts, the zeros. We should also include the y-intercept in the table. So when we're picking test points, we should also make sure that we graph the y-intercept. Number three, you need to think about the end behavior of the polynomial, as we discussed earlier. And number four, you put all this together, you plot the intercepts, you plot a few other points that you found in your table, and you sketch a smooth curve that passes through these points and exhibits the required end behavior. So to exemplify this, let's consider the polynomial p of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared minus 12x. The first thing I'm going to do is find the zeros of this polynomial, and I'll do that by factoring. So we can pull out a common factor of x, and then after doing that, we can factor the remaining trinomial as x minus 6 times x plus 2. And so from there, we can see that the zeros of this polynomial are x equals 0, x equals positive 6, and x equals negative 2.
So don't forget, when you factor out an x, x equals 0 will make this whole thing 0. And so that becomes one of your x-intercepts. Now, using those x-intercepts, I'm going to draw a number line. And I'm going to put those three values on the number line in numerical order. That divides up our number line, in this case, into three intervals. And then I'm going to pick test points. So to the left of negative 2, I will choose negative 5. Here, I will choose negative 1. Here, I'll choose 3. And over here, I will choose 10. And, and you can pick any number that you want, as long as it is a number that lies in the interval. And then I'm going to skip this part in terms of showing the work, but we would plug in each of these numbers into our polynomial. And it's easiest if you plug them into the factored form. Now what we're observing there when you plug it in is we're observing whether the value is positive or negative. So when you plug in x equals negative 5, you will get a, a negative number times a negative number times a negative number, which is a negative number. When you plug in negative 1, you will get a positive number. When you plug in 3, you will get a negative number. And when you plug in 10, you will get a positive number. And you want to be careful to not assume that it always alternates signs. Sometimes it does. In fact, most of the time it does. But it does not always alternate signs. So you want to make sure that you actually do the work plugging those numbers in. Now, what is this graph going to look like? Well, we have a few points that we can graph. So let's go ahead and bring a graph in now. And I'm just going to do a rough sketch by hand for this. But we can see that negative 2 is a 0, so it crosses the x-axis here. We can see that 0 is a 0, so it crosses the x-axis here. And also 6 is a 0. And then we have the information that to the left of negative 2, the graph is below the x-axis. In between negative 2 and 0, the graph should be above the x-axis. In between 0 and 6, it should be below the x-axis. And to the right of 6, it should be above. Also, I want to point out that each of these factors has a multiplicity of 1. In other words, these are all raised to the first power. And that means that with our x-intercepts, the graph will be passing through the x-axis. That's because those multiplicities are odd. So the graph looks something like this. Now, we don't have a lot of precision here. We don't have a lot of precision here. You'll notice that I did not scale the y-axis because I'm not really concerned about precise graphs at this moment. We can always get the precision here by plugging in some additional points in between these values to get a more precise graph. But right now, we're not really concerned about that precision. What we want to do is make sure that we have the correct x-intercepts, the correct behavior in terms of being above or below the x-axis, and also the correct end behavior and so we'll just point out that for an odd degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, it should go up on the right side and down on the left side. Let's look at another. For this next polynomial, we have g of x equals negative 2x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 3x squared. To graph this, let's first factor it. And we can do that by factoring out a negative and also an x squared. When you factor out a negative, all of these signs will change, of course. And then we can continue to factor. We know that 2x squared will be 2x times x. And we know that negative 3 will be 3 times 1, and one of those numbers has to be negative. So in this case, we'll put a 3 here and a 1 here. We need positive 3 and negative 1. And you can double check to make sure that this factorization is correct. To find the x-intercepts, we set this equal to 0. And we see that x is equal to 0, negative 3 halves, or positive 1. And 0 has a multiplicity 
equal to 2. And that's because the factor here is squared. That will have graphical implications. For the next step, we make a number line. And we put these numbers on that number line in order. And from there, we are going to test to see if the function is positive or negative on each one of these intervals. Now, I'm going to skip this part of it just because we showed how to do that in the previous examples. So when you plug in a number to the left of negative 3 halves, you'll see the function is negative. When you plug in a number in between negative 3 halves and 0, you'll get a positive. Between 0 and 1, you will also get a positive. And to the right of 1, you will get a negative. Now, in terms of the graphing implications of this, what that means is that we have a 0 at negative 3 halves. So the function touches the x-axis here. We also have a 0 at 0, so it touches there. And we have a 0 at x equals 1. Now, what does the graph actually look like? Well, let's think about this. We have a fourth degree polynomial with a negative leading coefficient. So we know no matter what happens, the end behavior has to be that the function is going down on both sides. This information, along with the fact that we know that to the left of negative 3 halves, the graph is below the x-axis, so it must be down here. In between negative 3 halves and 0, the graph is above the x-axis. From 0 to 1, it's also above. And beyond 1, it is below the x-axis. So if you put all this information together, the graph must come up like this. It has to be above the x-axis here, and it also has to be above the x-axis here. So that means at 0, it must barely touch. And of course, this is to be expected because 0 has multiplicity equal to 2. So the graph goes something like this. And again, this is just a sketch, but I want you to notice that the important features of the graph are consistent with what we would expect. The multiplicity of the factor 2x plus 3 and the factor x minus 1 is 1, since these are both raised to the first power. And that means that we get complete pass-throughs at the 0, negative 3 halves, and also at the 0, 1. At 0, multiplicity is 2, which means we just have a touch there, not a pass-through. And we have the end behavior going down on both sides. So this is a reasonable sketch of the polynomial function. Our next example is a third-degree polynomial function. Same idea, we would like to graph this polynomial function. So the first thing I'm going to do is factor the polynomial. And we can actually factor here by using the technique of grouping. So if we group the first two terms together, we can factor out x squared, which gives us x minus 2 left over. The last two terms, we can factor out a negative 4, which also gives us x minus 2 left over. Notice now we have a common factor of x minus 2. We can factor that out, and what we have left over is x squared minus 4. And x squared minus 4 is the difference of two squares, which factors into x minus 2 and x plus 2. So in the end, our final factorization is that we have x minus 2 to the second power times x plus 2 to the first power. And we're going to set that equal to 0. And in doing so, we get x-intercepts at 2 and at negative 2. Draw a number line. And then we need to test to see what's happening here. So when you plug in a number to the right of positive 2, you will get a positive value. When you plug in a number in between negative 2 and 2, you will also get a positive value. And if you plug a number in that is to the left of negative 2, you'll get a negative value. So what does this mean graphically? 
Well, it means that, of course, we have zeros at negative 2 and at positive 2. So we have x-intercepts there. By the way, the y-intercept, I should just mention, if you let x equal 0 into the original function, you'll get f of 0 is equal to 8. That's the y-intercept. So we can put a point on the y-axis at 8, representing that. And then the behavior tells us that to the right of 2, we are above the x-axis. In between 2 and negative 2, we are also above the x-axis. So if we are above and above, that means the 0 at x equals 2 is just a touch 0. And then, of course, to the left of negative 2, we are below. So the graph of this must look something like this. And lastly, I'll just point out that we have a touch at x equals 2 because the multiplicity of that factor is even. And we have a pass-through at negative 2 because the multiplicity of that factor was odd. Our final example involves a factored polynomial, x to the fourth power multiplied by x minus 2 to the third power times x plus 1 to the second power. Because everything's already factored, we can easily state our zeros as x equals 0, 2, and negative 1. We are then going to put those zeros on our number line. And we'll test to see if it's positive or negative on each of these four intervals. So you can see that to the left of negative 1, the function should be below the x-axis. Between negative 1 and 0 should also be below the x-axis. Between 0 and 2, also below the x-axis. And to the right of 2, it is above the x-axis. So let's go ahead and sketch a graph. So we have an x-intercept at negative 1. We have an x-intercept at 0 and an x-intercept at 2. We know that overall, the degree of this polynomial is what? Well, let's see. You have x to the fourth power here. You have x to the third power here and x to the second power. And x to the fourth times x to the third times x to the second is x to the ninth power. This is a ninth degree polynomial. You have a positive leading coefficient of x of a 1. And that means that the end behavior is that it goes up on the right side and it goes down on the left side. So we know it has to be down here and up here. And then between negative 1 and 0, it is below the x-axis. And between 0 and 2, it is below the x-axis. So the graph must do something like follows. Come up, barely touch, stay below, barely touch, stay below, and then finally pass through and go up from there. So the graph of this function must look something like this. And again, this is just a sketch. I'll bring in a graph from the graphing calculator just to show you. Now, as you can see, my graph looks fairly different from the graph we have here. The details in between negative 1 and 0 and in between 0 and 2 are very different from what I graphed here. Now, why is that the case? It doesn't matter. Well, the reason why it's the case is because I did not plug in any values of x in between these values here. So I could have gotten better precision by plugging in x equals negative 1 half and plugging in x equals 1. And if I would have done that, I would have seen that this graph here, this portion of the graph, drops down lower. Okay? So that's why it happened. Does it matter? And the answer is, right now, it really doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is get the basic pattern of the graph. We want to know where does it touch the x-axis, where is it above the x-axis, where is it below the x-axis, and what is the end behavior like. There's a lot of stuff going on in the middle here.
which you won't fully learn how to describe until you have calculus under your belt. So for right now, the graph that we had here is good enough. We'll make improvements on this in Math 1A.